Professor Omar Wasso sparked a major debate on Twitter when he questioned how long it would be before the GOP becomes a broadly multi-ethnic, multi-racial party. Or if such a thing is even possible. So the political scientists found the Republican Party maybe more likely to become more multiracial as U.S. demographics shift. So here to explain his findings is the party's future assistant professor of politics at Princeton University, Mr. Omar Wasso himself. Great to see you, Professor. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Professor, you kind of posed this question out on Twitter. You aggregated some of the most interesting responses since we've had the RNC this week. I thought, you know, for the future of the party itself, we'll bring in somebody like yourself. Explain some of the different scenarios that people laid out, what you think is most plausible, and where things might be headed. Sure. So right now, about 90 percent of the uh, Republican voting bloc is um, white, and that is in a country that's increasingly increasingly diverse, uh, going to be you know hard to hold a majority nationally, right? So that mm-hmm. that's kind of the puzzle is is the Republican Party is clearly you know able to hold the Senate now, able to win the presidency, but as we go forward in about 25 years, the uh, country will be essentially 50-50. Uh, white and uh, about 50% non-Hispanic white and, uh, sorry, Hispanic, Latino, Mm -hmm. uh, African-American, Asian-American, right? So you've got this more multicultural America in the future and like what's the transition potentially that the Republican Party might might undergo to move from being um, sort of, you know, essentially more uh, uh, in its current status where it's often feeling very exclusive uh, for those groups to one that might be more inclusive. Um, mm-hmm. And a couple of the key findings were uh, one that, you know, even if the Republican Party doesn't change much, it's likely over the next, call it 20 years or so, to become at least 20 percent uh, African-American, Asian-American, Latino. Um, and if you imagine a candidate, maybe a Marco Rubio or, uh, you know, uh, 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 Bush, um, uh, from Florida, Governor Bush, um, that, that, that it might be possible that a candidate who kind of campaigned more aggressively for those votes uh, could move that faster. So that, that's, I think, some of the, 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 the that's one scenario. Yeah. So I think that a lot of people were kind of thinking in that direction. After Mitt Romney lost, there was that's the right. autopsy, there was the attempt at comprehensive immigration reform, there was this recognition, okay, America's getting more diverse, we got to figure out a different coalition here. And Trump really sort of bucked that conventional wisdom by doubling down on this, you know, on white voters and especially having uh, particular strength with white working class voters. And one of the reasons that he was able to be successful in that is, number one, that, you know, where those voters are disproportionately congregated happen to be, you know, really important for the Electoral College. And there are strengths in the Senate in particular, obviously, for rural areas. Um, And two, you have such a large pool of non-voters in this country that if you can just pull some of those into your coalition, you don't necessarily have to deal with diversifying for quite a long time. And then you also have, you know, typical GOP sort of disenfranchisement attempts to keep the voting pool as they want it to be. So is that another potential future for the Republican Party? And how long can those tactics in that direction of the party last ultimately? Yeah, so that's that's I think the really central tension that you've got um, a kind of regional bases, uh, you know, whether at the you know at the house ca- uh, district level or at the state level, which are which will continue to be fairly homogenous, predominantly white, and where uh, you know taking a position on immigration that might uh, you know kind of repel maybe Latinos and Asian Americans, but uh, you know help mobilize uh, a, a, you know a part of the. Uh, white base, um, it's costless in those places. And so so you have local incentives to maybe take really hardline positions on immigration, but the national incentives are maybe to try and build uh, a broader coalition. And that's going to be a real tension because the party in many ways is going to be made up of, uh, you know, House members and Senate members who don't have the same incentives that a presidential candidate would have. Um, the other thing that you touch on, uh, two of them that I think are really important are one, uh, that the, the, the country is as, as it, even as it's diversifying, it's still highly clustered. So you know, much of the growth is in cities. Uh, by some estimates, in uh, 30 years, we'll have something like 70% of the U.S. population will be in cities, but 30% of the uh, will be in um, you know, sorry, in, in a few states. Um, but uh, uh, 
seventy percent of the Senate will be in these uh, areas that are you know more have uh, they are more rural, and so you're going to have this real disconnect between you know California having two Senate seats and Wyoming having two, um, and and that's going to mean that the, these rural areas get significantly more representation. But at some point, that's uh, that that tension you know it's, it's hard to imagine that kind of in, um, inequality sustaining. And then the last thing you point out, which is really important, is that you can think of kind of two broad strategies for the parties. One is we want to expand the voting block, a voting pool, and the other is a kind of we want to kind of narrow it. And what the Republican Party has really invested in as of late is uh, we want to kind of really focus on uh, whether it's at the level of the census or uh, you know changing voting rules to to narrow the voting base, yeah. and that you know in the short run may be sustainable, but uh, but at some point it's hard to see how that is a path to a consistent, sustainable national majority. I think some of your analysis is correct directionally. I would dispute the idea that immigration restriction or others is you know would turn off minority voters. Consider saying that Trump's Latino support is actually higher than Mitt Romney's and many others. Um, in the first place. But that kind of aside, one of the things that you and I had talked about offline when I when it was kind of inspired to book you for this segment was the idea I saw, which is that if the Democrats are going to become this kind of party of suburbanites, neoliberals, and large cities and university towns, then the only electoral path forward, it seemed to me, was that Republicans would have to excite kind of a pan-ethnic working class party. You said that voters just simply don't behave that way in kind of a pan-ethnic way. Uh, what do you think that the data shows in that particular way? And what are the main barriers and the constraints towards behaving that way? So a couple of key things. So I think one, you're right that Trump has shown an ability to grow in some ways the Latino base, uh, an African American base, but but those are starting at relatively low numbers and going up relatively modestly, right? So if you can take the black vote from eight percent to ten percent, that's growth, but it's 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 not uh, you know it's not it's not going to meaningfully uh, change the the, the 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 national coalition. Right. Um, we have seen similar, I agree, similar trends uh, among Latinos, but it's but it's still it, you know it's not really a path forward. Um, to the other part of your question, um, you know, I, I think the, 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 you know the sort of the one core question is, you know, what would the Republican Party stand for if it wasn't making such strong appeals to, and particularly with Trump, white grievance? Um, and what would it look like? So it might be that it's a culturally conservative party, but is not, uh, you know, and maybe it's even, uh, you know, tough on immigration, but it's not, you know, really uh, emphasizing in some ways these kind of cruel policies, caging kids kinds of things, right? You could imagine um, a, a, a conservative party that might have uh you know, is appealing to religious uh, minorities, appealing to you know the Muslim small business owner. The, those kinds of groups could be part of a Republican coalition that wasn't so grounded in what's sometimes called Christian nationalism, right? So, uh -huh. so the war on Christmas is uh, you know it's a great. A slogan if you're appealing to Christians, but if you're appealing to the growing number of Hindus or Muslims or you know the, the Jews in this country, that's that that that's going to be off-putting, right? So so th th there's potentially a kind of cultural conservatism, a maybe a, a kind of patriotic nationalism, but that's not so rooted in in this kind of long tradition of white supremacist or white grievance rhetoric that, that is very alienating to uh, non-whites, non-Christians. Yeah. Could you speak, because there's there's a, a push and a pull factor. You're, you've been talking about, you know, what could be an appealing message to diversify the GOP. On the flip side, are there messages that the Democratic Party could be moving towards that would push some of these voters out of their coalition? So, for example, you point to the fact that, you know, Latinos in this election so far have been perhaps the weakest point for Joe Biden. And some of the data I've seen suggests, in particular, working class Latino men seem to be slowly moving away from the Democratic Party. So as the Democratic Party sort of really, you know, doubles down on this affluent suburbanite approach to politics, are there is there also messaging that could be coming from that party that would push people in the other direction? Yeah, so I mean, there's a there's nice work by uh, two scholars, Hetherington and Weiler, that looks at a kind of broad trend what we've that we've seen in American politics, where the parties are sorting increasingly, and this goes back decades, on what traditionally was called authoritarianism, what they describe in a book called Pick Up or Prius um, as a as a more kind of fixed, you know, sort of order-minded model of America, or a more kind of flexible um, a model of or fluid, they they call it. Um, 
Um, and, and there are a lot of people in uh, you know, the black community, among Latinos, who have a, a, you know, a taste for order, a, you know, more tradition-minded, um, and that for them, the Republican Party could be very appealing and the kind of very change-oriented model of progressive politics might be somewhat alienating. And so it, it, it's, it's possible that a um, order-minded, tradition-minded version of the Republican Party that wasn't so uh, based in kind of an ethnic nationalism could be very appealing. And to your point, that the democratic uh, kind of embrace of, you know, whether it's uh, transgender rights or um, other kinds of uh, things that re reflect real kind of change in the uh, state of the American uh, uh, kind of, you know, how, how the, the commitment to egalitarianism can be unsettling to people who are more uh, kind of rooted in a traditional worldview, mm. right? And yeah. so, so I think some of those kinds of changes, um, while are uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a child of the civil rights movement, so I'm sort of sympathetic to those changes. But but for somebody who might be more socially conservative, you could imagine that might be uh, 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 off-putting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Really interesting stuff, Thank Professor. You, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll have more rising for you after this. <laughs>